1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 27 says this. And if you're taking notes, the title tonight would be The Benefits of Building Relationships. So I'm going to read this whole passage because it's a good passage. You, Because we're all home folk, you probably already know this, but I'm still going to read it because it's good. It says, just as a body, the one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptized into one spirit so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. Now, if the foot, we talked about foot this morning, remember, I get, don't wash your feet. If you, if the foot you say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not be for that reason to stop being part of the body, right? Your foot just can't walk away. <laughs> get it? Walk away? No. Your foot can't just walk away. It's part of your body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not uh, then for that reason stop being part of the body. Your ears are still your ears. If the whole body were an eye, and I always think Mike Wazowski, you with me? Mike, do you all know who Mike Wazowski is? You know, one eye, yeah, okay. Uh, that's what I think about. If the whole body were one eye, first of all, we would look silly. Get it? There's another pun. We would look, okay. Y'all, are y'all awake? I, these are good puns. These are very punny. Okay. They're very punny. Stop, stop, please. Okay. If, if someone says, if we're, okay, I'm not going to say it. Okay, I'm going to say it. If we're all one, if we're all one eye, no one would bat it. No, okay. So with the body were one eye, where would the sense of hearing be? In other words, if all we could do is see and not hear, what good would that be? What good would the ears be if the eyes were the only thing that mattered? But, 18 says, in fact, God has placed the parts in the body. Did you hear that? God has placed the parts in the body. Did you know, did you know that your little toe is one of the main balance things in your body along with your earlobes? Did you know that? Your little toe allows you to do the things that we do and your earlobes. I don't think much about my earlobes. I don't have pierced ears. One, I do not like pain. So that's the main reason I don't have an ear pierced, is I don't like pain anywhere in my body, is I don't have a tattoo either, because I don't want to have pain for three hours getting a tattoo. But I don't think much about my little toe, unless it's dark and I'm walking through my house. And then the little toe reminds me that it's there when it runs into the table. And then it reminds me, hello. God, it's God who has placed the parts in the body. Every part in your physical body, God has placed there. We have opposable thumbs. It's so we can do this. <laughs> Did you know when you're FaceTiming someone, you're FaceTiming someone and you do this, you know what happens? Fireworks behind you. Don't do it now. But later on, FaceTime somebody and do this. And fireworks behind you. Isn't that great? But we have opposable thumbs because it allows us to do things that other animals can't do. God knew exactly what he was doing, right? My Browns football team won today. Can you believe it? It's a miracle. God's still doing miracles. But imagine if the quarterback goes back to pass and there's no thumb. Nobody's throwing the ball. So God knew what he was doing when he gave us thumbs and he gave us small little pinky toes and he gave us earlobes. See, if, 19 says, if they were all one part, if they were all the same, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I get it. That's Paul's joke, not mine this time. I, so you can, when you get to heaven, talk to Paul like this, I, because you, you know, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. The parts of the body, the pinky toe is indispensable. I had a friend in fourth grade who lost four of her toes with a lawnmower. And she had a hard time walking. She'd walk around the pool, she'd be like, because her balance would be off. And you don't think about those toes until they're not there. Don't comb and try it. Don't do that. Um, not, not telling you to do that, but they're indispensable. And God says, 
that what seems to be the weakest part of the body is actually indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor, honor to the parts that lack it, so that, here's the reason, and now he's talking, making, he's been talking about the physical body, but now he's about to make the transition to the spiritual body. All of these things, all part of one body, all kind of different things, one part. How many bones do we have in our body? Is it 186, something like that? I think it's 186. 186. Most of them are in your hands. Isn't that crazy? Most of them are in your hands. So the things that we think, the physical things. Now he's transitioning, he says this, so that the reason God has put the body together, now he's talking spiritually, he's talking about a body of believers, both the Catholic, that's with a, a, a small c, Catholic meaning all, not the Catholic church, right? But meaning all the church universal and also the local body of believers in all parts of the world. It says God has put new life together so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers. When you smash your toe into a table, your entire body suffers. Amen? Amen. If you don't believe me, that you can try tonight. <laughs> don't cut them off, just jam them into a, a table. And your whole body's going to suffer. At the same time, if one part is honored, we rejoice. That's how the body of believers be. And then he says, now you, he's writing to the church of Corinth, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. So the Bible describes a state, the unity, unity of believers as a state of oneness, a state of harmony, a state of love, among believers in Christ. That's what the world needs to see. They don't need to see us accepting them and their sin. We accept them for who they are, knowing that they're lost in sin and we love them. But what they, the world is looking for, where can I find somebody who loves me like they love each other? You can walk in, listen, when I enter in pastor, I went to churches that when you walked into the sanctuary, when you walked into the building, you knew there were problems. You knew there were divisions. You knew this church was not all going in the same direction. And then to get up and preach. And then sometimes the message you're given, I'm like, I don't know these people. God, are you sure this is the message you have? And when I walk in the church, I go, holy cow. God knew exactly what he was doing because I'm going to get in here and tell them how it is because that's what they need to hear. Love among believers. The world is looking for true love. They're not finding it. They're not finding it. They're, they're, they're trying to find it. Listen, they, they started, I don't know if you know about OnlyFans accounts. They're doing these OnlyFans. It's basically pornography. They're trying to find love there. There are, there are so many dating apps. There are so many dating apps for married people because they're looking for love. There aren't a lot of dating apps for pastors, thank God, but I'm glad that was true, amen? People are looking for love. They want to find people who will love them for who they are, but not accept, and, and not to accept them for who they are, but not want them to stay the same, want them to grow in Christ. That's what the world's looking at. Philippians, Paul writes this, in Philippians 2, 2 and 4, he says, then make my joy complete. He's talking to the church in Philippi. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Uh, rather, in humility, value others. He's talking to, uh, he's talking to New Life Lakeland. Hey, here's how we should treat each other. Don't do anything out of selfish ambition or vain deceit, but, but value other people. That first time guest that walked in, right? And, and some of them walk in and they don't have the nicest clothes on. 
man, we better, be, we better be shaking our hand just like the guy that walks in driving a Lamborghini with a suit and tie. Because that's what they're looking for. That's what he's saying here. We should, with humility, value others. We, I should value you more than my own life. I should treasure you and value you and not do anything out of selfish ambition. Not looking to our own interests, but to each of you, to the interest of others. So this basically is the first three weeks of the Dare to Care Challenge, right? The Dare to Be Great Challenge. 1 Corinthians 1.10, Paul writes this, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Okay, now listen, I want to clarify something. We are not all going to agree on everything. Right? It's like the, I, I remember the, one of the funniest old uh, uh, jokes that, kind of a joke that said that one time this church was going to get a chandelier. They were going to get a new chandelier. And they, 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 so they were talking about it. They had a business meeting about it. And this one old guy stood up and said, listen, we don't be needing no chandelier. First of all, we can't pay for it. And second of all, ain't nobody know how to play one. We're not always going to agree on the chandelier. We're not going to agree on the color of paint. I mean, I know a church, because I preached at the church. The church split in two when they were trying to decide the color of the carpet. What? Who cares about the color of the carpet? Does anybody here care? I mean, if we had to replace this carpet... Do, do we have to have a, a color team get together and then we say, everybody wants pink, get on this side, and the blue's on this side, and if you want another color? That's crazy. We're not all going to agree on everything, and that's okay. You know, that's even a good thing because that means we're not all the same. That's okay. Guess what? We're not all one eye. We're not all the, the eye, and we're not all the toe. And we're not all the knee. And you know how important knees are? Yeah, knees are really important. You don't think about your knees. Anybody think about your knee today? Nobody thought about their knee today. I thought about my knee the other day. You know why? Because I went out on my lanai, and the water was coming in, and I went, (laughs) and when I got up, the skin was coming off my knee. And then I thought about my knee a lot because it hurt. But sometimes we don't think about the things that are important. We are all one body. And it doesn't matter whether you're the mouthpiece or the pinky toe. You are just as valuable. And I say this all the time. I say it all the time. Just because I'm up here preaching a sermon, and just because it's my face that goes out and I say hi to my mom. She's watching. Hi, mom. And it, just because it's all this thing, that doesn't mean I'm any more important to this body of believers than the one who's in the nursery this morning changing poopy diapers. Amen. Because who am I going to preach to if nobody's volunteering in the nursery and the parents aren't bringing their children anymore, they're going somewhere else, and eventually there's nobody here to preach to, so who cares what you have to say? Nobody's more important than anybody else. We're all one. So here's the thing. You ready? So there's six things I'm going to give to you real quick. And you're like, six? We're running out of time. We'll get them. You ready? Number one, relationships provide mutual support. Right? Listen, we, we should have relationships with believers and unbelievers. That's called disciple making. Right? We build relationships with people who are not believers. Now, it's a different kind of relationship. Right? But with other believers... It's mutual support. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, 10 says, two are better than one. I'll promise you that. When there would be, my brother is four years older than me, and he would, when he was, you know, he's this tall still. When I was this tall, he would pick on me. He would hold me down. He would pin my arms down. He would get his knuckle. Have you ever heard a knuckle sandwich? And he, and I, oh, let me up. No, stop crying. Uh. And he'd say, say, uncle. Uncle, which one? I had four. Oh, Uncle Charlie. No, Uncle Charlie, bam. And I did have an Uncle Charlie. That was bad. Because every time you see Uncle Charlie, bam. 
But when I got a little bit taller, but what would happen is, because I was the little brother, I was his to pick on. But there was a kid in the neighborhood when we were playing baseball, and I was always playing with the older kids, and he started picking on me. Guess what happened? My bigger brother beat him up. And he says, he, he, if anybody's going to pick on him, it's going to be me. Right? Because two are better than one. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, the other can help them up. We know that. Remember that commercial? Help, I've fallen. I can't get up. Well, if there were two people there, guess what? She wouldn't be. You got it. You got it. Relationships are designed to provide support, encouragement, and help when we face difficulties. Listen, what you are going through right now, some of you are going through it right now. The good news is God's with you. The also good news is just as important as God is with you, we are with you. And the reason it's more important to be, when you're going through it, to be in the church and be in relationships with other believers is one, they can pray for you, but two, they may have already gone through what you've gone through and they can walk alongside you and help you get through it. Or there may be someone that hasn't gone through it, but they're watching you. And you're helping them to know how to get through it, especially new believers. It's important. Relationships provide mutual support. By building relationships, we create a network of care. When one hurts, we all hurt. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. Relationships, re oh, and by the way, just so you know, um, one of the guests that we had this morning, they had twins. And I'm sitting there going, we, and I told Fred and Tiffany, they're the ones that have double sets of twins, and my Tiffany has twins. I said, we're a church of twins, right? You notice that? We've got a lot of twins in our church. So I'm thinking about having a twins day. What do you think? And I told Fred that, and he goes, let's do it, because he's got two sets of twins. And I, I said, do you got any more kids? He said, no, I'm not going to take a chance of having a third set of twins. <laughs> okay, so just so you know that. So, but what happens is when we're together, we, we can build each other, lift each other up in times of need. Number two, re relationships reflect God's love. 1 John 4, 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Relationships reflect God's love. God is love. See, the world, that's the part of the Bible they're okay with. When you say God is love, they're good with that. The problem is, they're not seeing the kind of love that God expects of his believers because we're not loving the world like he told us to. Because we're not even loving each other like he told us to. Listen, there's a lot of churches where there's not a lot of love. But we should love each other. When we build relationships with each other, then that reflects the love of God because God loves See, genuine relationships are based on mutual care and love, which glorifies God, and that draws others to him. We said this morning, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Three, relationships sharpen and strengthen us. Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron. So one person sharpens another. Healthy relationships challenge us to grow, learn, and become better versions of ourselves. Healthy relationships. What happens is we invest in, when we invest in relationships, we allow ourselves to be sharpened, to be strengthened, and held accountable in our walk with Christ. I have men, most of the mentors that I had early on in life are gone. And by gone, I mean gone. I mean, they're in heaven, and I'm a little jealous because they made it before me. So I've had to surround myself with other, most of them my age or similar ages, and I am accountable to them because I want to be sharpened. I want someone to tell me, hey, right, Greg knows this. I, I'm out here, man. I'm in 2027 with the church. We're already doing this, this, and this, and Greg's like, whoa, he's pulling the rope. Come on back, come on back, come on back. And I told him at the beginning, I said, listen, I give you the right and the honor and the privilege to slow me down. And every once in a while, I get a text, hey, pastor. And I'm like, oh, here we go, I'm going to slow down. 
But I need that. We all need that. I know pastors who won't allow people to speak in their lives. And that's when they get off doctrinally. That's when they get off. And that's why we're seeing a number of pastors fall. We're seeing them fall from grace. You know why? Because they refuse to allow people to speak in their lives, especially people that won't say what they want them to say. Right? I want God to sharpen me. I want to build healthy relationships. When we, when we are walking in unity, it sharpens us. It holds us accountable in our walk. That's what discipleship is. Jesus held his disciples accountable. Right? How many times did Jesus face palm and say, have I been with you this long and you don't get it? He corrected them, didn't he? He corrected them. He held them accountable. Number four, relationships create unity and harmony. I love this. Psalm 133, one. And there's an old song that used to go, I, I was trying to remember the tune to it, but I can't, so I won't sing it for you. I know you're sad. But it was how good and pleasant it is when God's people dwell together. And it goes, dwell together in unity. That part I remember. I can't remember any other. Anybody remember that song? It was about 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago. It was a while ago, wasn't it? Now, Whew. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. See, God desires unity among his people. It doesn't mean we're always going to agree. Understand that. It doesn't mean we're always going to like the same thing. It doesn't mean that every song we sing, we're all going to go, that's the best song ever. Right? And there are going to be some songs we sing that we may not even like. That's okay. We're worshiping God, not what you like. I want to sing Shout to the Lord. I'm, when I say that, we joke about it, but tell Jonathan, I'm serious. When he puts it on the list and I get the list and I'm going to play and like, yeah, a tip. Two Sunday nights from now, we're singing Shout to the Lord. And I'm ready that night, man. I'm ready. And there's some songs we sing that I'm kind of like, eh, that's not that singable. But guess what? I'm not the worship pastor. That's his job. He picks the songs as God leads him. He, he listens to the Holy Spirit. And he does a great job worship, which is why he's never allowed to leave. I mean, ever. I mean, if I ever get a call for a job recommendation, I say, he's the worst employee ever. He's terrible. Never shows up on time. You don't want anything. And his, his wife, holy cow, don't even go there. That's the recommendation that he's getting from me. That's there, man. That's what God says. <laughs> we build, where was that? I don't even know where I was. I was singing a song. God desires, <laughs> I know, I was trying to sing a song I couldn't remember. Uh, it's, we're not always going to agree on things. We're, we're painting the foyer different colors. We're going to be painting the hallways different colors. It's all, Kelly's designed it. She's got a great eye. If you don't believe me, you should see her house. You should see she's done houses for Tiffany. You should see they look, they look gorgeous. She did the nursery. She did that room. She, she's got an eye for it. You know what I don't have an eye for? That. I can paint it. What color do you want to paint it? I don't care. You pick the paint, I'll, I'll paint it. You pick the color. That's what I do. So we're not always going to agree, but we need to live in unity. We need to be about the same business, the same job. We need to be able to agree. One of the things with the board, one of the things that we, we do is we don't always agree. We don't always see eye to eye, and sometimes we can, we, and we talk it out. But the one thing we agree on is we're going to move forward in what God has for our church, even if we disagree on things. Because just having a disagreement doesn't mean we're going to go our separate ways. It means we're going to work together to make this happen. Iron sharpens iron. See, when we when we're living together in unity and building strong relationships that promotes peace, harmony, and a sense of belonging, families, churches, and communities. Listen, a lot of the people that are coming to our church, their life's a mess. They're a mess. I mean, more a mess than we are. You remember when your life was a mess before you came to Jesus? It's one of the reasons they come to church because their life is so a mess. And when they walk into a place and they can sense that people don't like each other, they can sense that. They know that when they walk in the door. When they walk in a new life, they walk in and they go, ah. Oh. Had someone say to me today, they walked in and said, ah, oh, my friend said that I should come here. We'll be back next Sunday because I love it. This is great. Why? Because when they walk in, they can sense there's a peace about this. There's a contentment. There's a worship. In our worship services, we have people that get happy and sing and dance and clap their hands. We have people that sit down and worship God. And, and guess what? Nobody cares. 
Nobody cares. Worship God because how God touches you. Right? That's what we do. And people sense that. When, when, we're, when we're building relationships with each other, when people come in that haven't been to church in 15 years, they don't want to come into a mess because they already have a mess. Their life's a mess. They want to come someplace where they can feel like, oh, man, there's peace here. And whatever you have, I want it. I want it. People sense that. They sense that. Unity, when, through unity, we become a powerful witness to the world of God's love. Number five, relationships provide wisdom and counsel. Proverbs 15, 22, plans fail for lack of counsel. But with many advisors, they succeed. Right? I can tell you this, and Greg can tell you this. There's not, a, and, and, and with the board, there's not a single thing that we have done that we have changed that the first thing I did was I went to Greg and we talked about if it's a financial thing, do we have the money for it? Is it a situation? Can we get this? What about this? What about this? What can we do? And then meet with the board and I say, here's the idea I have. Here's the thing I want to do. And the board, the same thing. They ask questions. You know why? I don't have all the answers. And sometimes I'll say something, Greg and I'll be talking about something, and I'll say, man, blah, 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 and Greg, and he brings up a point. And he says, well, what about this? And I go, oh, I didn't think about that. That's good. Let's do that instead. Because my way's not always right. I I'm okay with other people having ideas. I promise you that. And so when we, uh, wisdom and counsel, relationships allow us to seek wisdom and counsel, right? I don't have all the answers. As I was going through, I went to Southeastern, and then I became a pastor for years, and then I went and got my first master's, and then I went and got my second master's, then I started working on my doctorate. I'm thinking, well, the more edumacated I get, I'm going to get me some edumacation, and I'm going to have all the answers, and I'm going to help everybody know all the answers. No, 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 no. What I found through edumacation is I have more questions, but I'm learning to ask the right questions to the one who has all the answers. And I'm not, I love education. In fact, I wish the Assemblies of God, and I'm going to put this out there on the internet, I wish we would finally pass an ordinance that would require all licensed ordained ministers to continue their education. It's important. It's vital. And we're one of the only denominations that don't require anything after they're licensed or ordained. And I think it's a shame. It's a downright dirty, rotten shame. And that's my point. If you get that, I'll be getting a call from Doug on that one. I think he's for it. Okay, anyway, so when, when we have relationships, wise counsel, when we face tough decisions, see, when we build relationships, so when people come to Christ, they start coming to church, they start getting to know people because they go into small groups, and then all of a sudden, something happens, and they've not faced this before. Guess what? They now have people that they have invested their life in and they, they trusted their life to that's going to help them with their decisions, help them not necessarily make the decision for them, but help them ask the right questions. That's what counseling is. Counseling is not giving you the answers. Counseling is helping you ask the right questions so that you can find the answer. And that's what happens when we're building relationships. We are helping others to find the answers by helping them walk through it, counsel and wisdom. Through relationships, we receive guidance that help us avoid mistakes, right? The, 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 the big saying that everybody says is, um, it's a wise man who learns from other people's mistakes. You all know that, right? It's a wise person. So you see someone make a mistake, and you see it, you're like, I'm not going to make that mistake. Boo! It's a, a wise, it's a wise man who, what is it? It's a wise person who learns from his mistakes, but it's a wiser person who learns from the mistakes of others. See, if you make mistakes, let me, let me change that. When you make mistakes, because you're going to make mistakes, I'm going to make mistakes, learn from them. What can we do differently next time? How can we change this? How can we make this better? How can we become greater in God's eyes? But it's wiser when we see other people and learn from their mistakes. And see, when there's new babes in Christ that are coming to church and getting involved in a small group, we're able to help them not make some of the same mistakes that we made. Amen? Amen. And isn't that good when we can help others not make the same mistakes we did? And here's number six, the last one. Relationships are essential 
for fulfilling the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19. Y'all know this one? Therefore, as you are going, make disciples of all nations, baptize them, teach them to obey all that I've commanded, and I am with you to the end of the age. That's my book, right? So that's the whole thing. That's why I got that memorized. And it begins with all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, as you are going, make disciples. Right? The good news is that's the call we're all supposed to do. How many of you are glad, and you can raise your hand, how many of you are glad, and, and this doesn't count for Jonathan or Daniel or Greg or Grant or Dakota, um, how many of you are glad God didn't call you to be a pastor? You can raise your hand. Come on, raise them. Get them up there. Yes, so am I. I'm glad God didn't call you to be a pastor because then you wouldn't be here, right? How many of you are glad that God didn't call you to teach Sunday school? It's okay, say, because some people, they're not good teachers. And it's okay to admit that, right? Like, I, I would not do well on the safety team. You know, because I like being in the service. I, I would like, I'd be, I'd be walking around talking, not paying attention. You know? So I, I know I wouldn't do well. I have a short attention span. Right? So we, we need each other. We build relationships. Listen, I said this, I taught at the, I taught at the um, conference on Friday. Um, at Victory, the state conference Friday. And, and I told him, I said, the great commission he gave to his disciples. He didn't give them to one disciple. He gave to all the disciples. And it's meant for all of us. And there's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. Now, l- let, me say, let me say this to you. In the United States of America, we have American individual exceptionalism. We're going to pull up our bootstraps. We're going to make it. Right? We don't need any help. And, I mean, that, that's what makes America great. That's why Daniel Boone and some of those crazy people that are our relatives went from wherever they were, and they just went across. There's no trails. There's nothing there. They're just walking through forests. There's bears and what, and, and, they're, and they're trailblazers. Thank God that I wasn't born in the 1800s, as I would not have been a trailblazer. I would not have been with Daniel Boone. I'd have been in eating crumpets and tea, you know, I'd have been over there doing that. And that works for the United States of America. It's what makes our country great, that you can start anywhere you want and you can become whoever you want to be. That's great. But when it comes to the things of Christ, there's no Lone Ranger Christianity. I'm going to tell you this, you cannot do it on your own. You will fail every single time and even that's a misnomer because the lone ranger had tonto and he had his horse i used to think the horse's name was hi-ho silver but i found out it was just silver i was really disappointed because i thought his name was hi-ho silver and it's just silver isn't that crazy that was a disappointing day in my life there's no such thing as lone ranger christianity you need me and I need you, and I need you for more than five, min- five seconds on a Sunday morning to shake my hand. I need you, and I'm going to say this because you're all home folk. I need you every Sunday to wear a name tag. I do. It's important. Do you know why? When new people come in, what's the worst thing? They don't know anybody. But when you have a name tag, they know you. They know you. Do you know why we're in tag on Sunday morning? Mostly because it's Stan. I got to remember my own name because I'm trying to focus on the sermon. And so I have to remind myself, it's Stan. Okay, I have to learn to read upside down. I wear that as an example. I want you to wear it. And when I see people and I'm shaking hands and I have my headphone on, when I have these on, I'm out there shaking hands with people, they don't know I'm the pastor unless they've seen online but they know my name. So I want you to wear a name tag on Sunday mornings. I want you to wear it. Not for you, not for you, but for them, for them. They need to come into a place and feel the relationship has already started because they already know. Remember the the, the TV show Cheers? Cheers. We want to go to a place where everybody knows your name. And the saddest thing is, the bar is the place where everybody knows your name. And it should be the church. 
It should be the church. So when they walk into a place, their life's a mess. They don't know anybody. They, they just are already, the devil's already beating them up, saying, what are you doing? They're not going to accept you. When they find out what you're doing, they're going to kick you out. And they're all going to be wearing suits and ties and long dresses and have their hair up in a bun. Ladies, remember those days? All the women are like, they're completely silent. Like, you going back to that? No. Kidding me? They're already getting beat up before they ever get here. And when they walk in and there's friendly people who have name tags on, and all of a sudden they don't feel so alone. And guess what the other thing is? Do you know that you remember somebody's name more if you see it? Yeah. The Great Commission requires us to work together. It requires us to connect with others. It requires us to build trust. It requires us to lead. And I'm not talking about believers in the, in the church. I'm talking about it requires us to reach out beyond ourselves to the world. It requires us to connect with other people. The Great Commission was given for everybody. S to some he gave to be apostles, pastors, teachers, prophets, and evangelists as gifts to the body. But all of you all and me, he's called to go and make disciples, which requires us to get out of our comfort zone and to talk to people and build relationships with people so that they can see our love for Jesus. And it will lead them toward a relationship with him. Meaningful relationships are a key avenue for making disciples. So here's the conclusion. I want you to stand. Here's the conclusion. Here's the conclusion. Okay. Practical applications, right? We see that relationships are not only a source of strength and support, but it's also vital for our own spiritual growth. Our own spiritual growth. It's vital for unity among believers. It's vital for those of you who are introverts to step out of your comfort zone, right? To build relationships. Because when we are building relationships and when we are in unity, then we can fulfill God's purposes on this earth, both for our individual lives and for new life Lakeland. That's what God wants to do. And I'm going to close with this. I'm going to say that the altars are open. If you need prayer tonight for any reason, and we have a number of people who are, um, they're having um, not surgery, what's the other thing this week? They're having scopes done this week. And so we want, there's a number of people, and there's people that are still in rehab. Ian's still in rehab, Diane. We still want to continue to pray for them. But if you have a need and you want to come down this evening and pray, we're going to pray with you this evening. And, and we'll worship for a few minutes afterwards. But remember this. One of the last things when Jesus had the disciples together is he had a prayer for them. John 17 is a great prayer. That's where he says, I am the vine, we are the, he's the vine, we're the branches. It's all these great things. And one of the last things that Jesus prayed, he said, my prayer is not for them alone, the disciples. My prayer for those who believe in me through the message. So it wasn't just for them, it's for everybody, us, 2,000 years later. He says, and this is the message, that those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one as the Father and I are one. When a church is one in mission, when a church is in unity and moving forward, that's when God brings blessings. That's when God blesses what's happening. Listen, there's a lot of great things happening. A lot of people getting involved, a lot of new people coming, a lot of people getting saved, a lot of people getting baptized. It's exciting time. But remember this, when the church starts growing, when new people start coming, that's when the devil comes in because he ain't happy. He wants us just to go back to just being introverted and being our own self and doing what we like and who cares what anybody, that's what he wants. 
and that's not going to happen here. So we're going to push back the darkness by being one and going forward. Amen? And what God has for us. So let's pray. Lord.